hello everybody this morning it's uh great to be together isn't it to study god's word as you know we're looking at a few verses in romans chapter 3 and today we're going to be uh, focusing on verses 21 and 22 so if you've got your bible let me just read those two verses to you romans chapter 3 verses 21 and 22 but now apart from the law the righteousness of god has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify this righteousness is given through faith in jesus christ to all who believe there is no difference between jew and gentile you remember that last week roger uh, kicked off this series with a very clear um, depiction of our as he described it our clear and present danger um, that we are in because of sin he spoke of how of man's godliness godlessness rather which leads to wickedness and how that we are without excuse there's no excuse for the way in which we have turned our backs on god and as a result we are under god's wrath but roger ended on a positive note um, as he uh, approached that first word in this in this passage that we're studying that word but and uh, he ended with a, a quote of a hymn there is a way back to god from the dark paths of sin well before we dive into verses 21 and 22 i think we need to just think a little bit more about the predicament that we're in you know, when you're in a hole, the natural inclination is to try and uh, find your way out of the hole. And uh, in our predicament under the wrath of God, our inclination is to try and find a way out of that by ourselves. And uh, how do we do that? Well, we try to be good. We try to do good. In effect, we try to obey God's law. So what is God's law? We need to think about what God's law is. And I think God's law can be expressed in three different ways. First of all, there's what I might call the natural or universal law of God. This is something that Paul uh, addresses earlier on in this book of Romans, how that everybody has a basic understanding of God's character. We see that as we look at creation. We see something of his power and his beauty. And we have that basic understanding of God's character. We also have a basic understanding of what is right and wrong. And we have a conscience that uh, warns us when we're in danger of, of, of breaking that law. Let's just look back quickly at uh, some verses in these opening chapters of Romans. Uh, in chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, Paul says, Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. And then a little bit later on in chapter 2, verse 14, he says, Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show what the requirements of the law are. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them, and at other times defending them. So there is this natural, universal law that we have this basic understanding of right and wrong. But for the Jewish nation, God uh, expressed that in more detail. He gave them his written law. It's the, the moral law. And you'll find it in the opening books of the Bible, particularly the book of Deuteronomy, and summed up, of course, in the Ten Commandments. God very clearly uh, expressing there in written form uh, what he expects, what, uh, what moral behavior should really look like. But, you know, there's a problem because none of us have been able to keep God's law, whether that's this natural universal law or whether it's the written law of God given to the Jews, none of us have been able to keep that law. If we look just a little bit further back in chapter 3, uh, second part of, of verse 9, Paul says, For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike 
are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Very clear there that we cannot keep God's law. We just cannot be good enough for God. But then for the Jews, God gave this third expression of his law. It's what we might call the ceremonial law. And again, we find it in those early books of the Old Testament, particularly in the book of Leviticus, where God instituted uh, sacrifices, animal sacrifices and offerings and cleansing rituals. And he gave his people these things as a ceremonial law as well as the moral law. And, and what, what was the purpose of this ceremonial law? Why did God give them this? The writer to the Hebrews tells us in chapter 9, verse 13, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean, outwardly clean. In other words, God was giving them this way in which they could perhaps come before him into his presence to worship him, this outward cleanliness. But it could never cleanse them internally. It could never really deal with the heart problem of sin. In fact, the writer to Hebrews goes on in chapter 10 to say it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The ceremonial law could never really deal with the sin problem. It gave the people a way of approaching God, but it could not really deal, away, de deal with the sin problem. It couldn't take away sin. So we might wonder, well, what is the purpose then of God's law? If we can't keep it, if the sacrifices aren't sufficient to really deal with the sin problem, what is the purpose of God's law? Well, we, we read and we look at this in, in, in chapter 3, verse 20, the, the verse before our passage that we have before us today, that the purpose was to show us, the purpose of God's law is to show us our sin. Look at that verse 20 in chapter 3. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. In other words, we can't keep it. We can't get righteous by keeping God's law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. God has given us his law to show that we are sinful people. If we didn't have his law, we would be ignorant of sin. But because he's given us his standard of righteousness, we can measure up to that and see uh, that we are sinful. It's a bit like a spirit level. A spirit level can't make things level, but a spirit level will show you when things are, 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 are out of uh, kilter and they need to be put right. And that's what God's law does. It just shows us the sin in our lives. So we can't keep God's law. We can't make ourselves righteous enough to come into God's holy, pre holy presence. We can't scramble out of that hole. We're in quite a hopeless dilemma. And then we come to verse 21. And verse 21 begins with two very small but very, very important words. Those two words, but now, but now. That first word, but, according to the dictionary, it says it introduces a, fa a phrase or clause contrasting with what has already been mentioned. In contrast to this hopeless dilemma that we're in, that we've, we've broken God's law, we can't do anything to get out of this hole, we can't make ourselves righteous enough to be in his presence, that word but leads us into something which is offering hope, offering a different uh, uh, look at things. When all seems lost, there might just be another way. And then we have that other word, now. You know, the word now can be just a, a simple grammatic term for moving on an argument. Paul uses it in verse 19. He says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. It doesn't really, really mean very much. It's just moving the argument on. But now can also refer to a specific moment in time. Think of a mother with her child and uh, the child has done something naughty 
and then the, 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 they come to some sort of reconciliation. The, the mother talks to the child and she says, now you know I love you. Now she's not saying now at this moment in time I love you. I didn't love you before, but now I do. And it, she's not even saying that the child now knows that uh, he is loved. Uh, the child has always known that. So in that in that sense, the, the mother is using this sort of just small figure of speech, this 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 grammatic term, just to move uh, the the discussion on. But if the if the child persists in uh, in doing the naughty thing, and the and the mother says come here now, then that's a rather different use of the word now. She is saying at this moment in time, I want you to come here and listen to me and be obedient to me. And so now can mean this moment in time. And uh, we know that Paul is, is talking a bit in that sense, because if you look at verse 26, he says he did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. So at the present time is, is basically the same as now. It's a longer version of the word now. And Paul is saying that something has happened in this moment of time that has changed everything. Something has happened to bring us hope in this predicament that we're in. Something has happened in time. A historic event has occurred that has made all the difference. And that's something that's so important uh, as Christians because... Uh, most religions rely upon the philosophies, the teachings of, of some person, some group of people, whatever. Christianity is very much based in historical time, in facts, in things that have occurred. And uh, we must never forget that factual, historic basis for our faith. It's not just the philosophy of, 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 of men. It's not just something that someone's dreamed up. It is very much based in what has happened in time. And what is this historic event that has changed everything? Well, of course, it's the death of Jesus Christ that has changed everything. Just read uh, these verses again. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. God has done something through this historic event, the death of Jesus, that means that we now no longer try and need to try and scramble out of this hole ourselves. We no longer need to try to become righteous by keeping the law. Instead, God says, I can pull you out of that hole. I can make you righteous. I can give you a righteousness, the, the righteousness that is perfect and spotless. We're, we're moving into a doctrine which Martin Luther called the Great Exchange, the Great Exchange. It's summed up most clearly in Paul's writing to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, where he says this, God made him, that's Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God says, I will take away your sin. I'll still pour out my wrath on that sin to satisfy my justice, but I'll do that by laying that sin upon my son, Jesus. And when we get to verses 24 and 25 later in this series, we'll, we'll look at that a bit more, what that really meant for God to lay our sin upon Jesus. God says, I'll lay my, your sin upon my son, so that you won't have to bear that wrath that you deserve. And then God says, and I will give you something in exchange for your sin. And he says, I won't just forgive you your sin. I will do something even better. I know this is not a perfect illustration, but it seems to me that forgiveness is a little bit like Tipex. Do you remember in those uh, distant days in the past where before we had computers, we used to actually type up documents on, on typewriters? And if you were like me, rather ham-fisted, you would make loads and loads of mistakes as you type that document. And whereas on a computer, you can go back and edit it. In those days, you were stuck with those mistakes. And then someone invented this, this uh, cor um, I think they called it correction fluid, uh, called Tipex, where you could uh, get this white uh, liquid and paint it over your mistakes and, uh, and, 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 and retype it. 
the, the mistakes are still there, but they are tipexed over. You know, when we forgive someone, the sin is still there. The memory of it remains. Yes, the relationship might be restored, and that's a wonderful thing, but the sin cannot actually be wiped out. It may yet in future raise its ugly head. It might even put that forgiveness in jeopardy. Now imagine you, you, you typed a document and you snow paked over all your, or the snow paked, that's going back even further, I think, tipexed over all your, all your mistakes. And uh, then a professional typist comes along and looks at your document and thinks, hmm, that looks a bit of a mess really. And says, would you like me to type that up again for you? And she types up a brand new, perfect doc document. You see, God doesn't just forgive our sins. He doesn't just tip X over them. He takes away our sin and he gives us instead a brand new, perfect righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's as though we've never, ever sinned. It's that radical. He just gets rid of our sin, gives us the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And this, says Paul, is what the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, as he describes it here, were always pointing to. Those sacrifices, those offerings, those cleansing rituals, they were just a picture pointing forward to the time when Jesus would make that final perfect sacrifice. That sacrifice that would enable us to be fully cleansed and clothed in his righteousness. Well, how does all this work out in practice? Is it all automatic? Does God clothe everyone in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ? No, look at verse 22. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. We need to respond to what God has done by believing in it. And when we say believe, what we really mean is by trusting in it, putting our whole trust in this and this alone. You see, we have a choice. We can go on trying to earn our salvation by doing good, by trying to be good, by trying to keep God's law and make ourselves righteous in that way, trying to scramble out the hole by ourselves. Or we can acknowledge that we can't do this. That we can't be good enough. We need God to get us out and to believe and trust that Jesus has done what it takes to get rid of our sin and trust in that alone. And when we do that, when we have that real trust in what Christ has done for us upon the cross, then God gives us this gift of righteousness that enables us to stand in his holy presence. Yes, in this life, we will continue to sin. But the wonder is that this great transaction is sufficient to cover all our sin, whether that be sins of the past, the present or the future. It covers all of our sin and this way of salvation paul says applies to all he goes on there is no difference between jew and gentile those distinctions of the past are done away with all must come this one way trusting in christ and allowing god to clothe us in his righteousness and so as i close i have to ask this question whether you're listening live today or maybe watching this on youtube are you trusting in Christ for salvation or are you still trying to make yourself good enough for God? You know, Isaiah back in the Old Testament, chapter 64, verse 6, says this. He says, all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. The real question is when we finally stand before at that final judgment, what will we be trusting and what will we be relying on? Will we be relying on our own goodness, our own filthy, ragged righteousness, for that's how God sees it? Or will we be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus? May I urge you, if you've not done so, to trust in Christ now 
to allow God to clothe you in his perfect righteousness. We're going to close with a song. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. The last verse says this. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, clothed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Amen.